We're going to come to the message this morning. And uh, today I want to talk about being born in the Spirit. Um, John 3 is a really important passage um, in the light of the whole gospel and, and the scriptures. Uh, of course, Jesus is meeting with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And that guy comes to him at night because he's he doesn't, you know, it's all uncertain and the, the religious leaders are basically against Jesus. But Nicodemus is getting an idea that there's more to this Jesus than he might have thought. And so he comes to him at night and he is a genuine seeker. This is not some Pharisee trying to test Jesus. This is actually really genuine uh, seeker who wants to find out who Jesus actually is and what's going on. And so th I think this story, I think, the John 4 story with the Samaritan woman. Uh, I think it's Mark 10 with the rich young ruler. Uh, these are really important stories for us in terms of the gospel and the kingdom in Australia uh, and around the world for that matter. But they really are important stories. And I, I want us to look at John 3 today because Jesus, really Jesus explains and he reveals that we can only perceive and experience life, real life, in the power of the Spirit that the natural existence that we have um, is, is really just a shadow or an outworking of God's will and plan, but it's not the real deal, that the real deal is the kingdom of God, which is imperceptible, invisible, and is powered by the spirit of God. And that's what that's what eternity is going to be about. I mean, yes, there's re it's real. It's, I'm not saying there's nothing. You know, Jesus rose with a real resurrected body, and so will we. I'm not saying any of that. But the kingdom of God is empowered by the spirit of God. The, 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 re, the natural reality we see around us, i got a window here I can look out. I'm looking at a building now, but I can normally look up that way and we can look at uh, the mountains and the escarpment over Wollongong. And, and you know, that, that natural reality it is not really what's going on. And that's what Jesus opens up to this Pharisee, this, this uh, religious leader. It's really important for us to get a hold of. By the way, I just thought about our uh, Queensland friends, both here and also those who watch from up in Queensland. Commiserations during the week. Hard to be sad, but there you go. Um, John chapter 3. Let's have a look. Father, I pray that you would bless our reading of your word today in Jesus' name. John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's basically saying, I recognize that there's something going on here. But Jesus is now going to pick this up and really focus in on what's important. Jesus answered him, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? And he goes on to talk about how he's witnessing of what he knows and encouraging Nicodemus to, uh, to come alive in the Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, I know you're a teacher sent from God because you've, these great signs, these amazing things have been done. And Jesus, as usual, is not too interested in people's opinion of him, but he's now going to cut to the chase for Nicodemus to understand what he's got to do to really connect with God and find eternal life because that's what Jesus is all about. He, he wants to make disciples and he wants this guy to be a, a disciple of his and he wants him to be a follower uh, of God and to be genuinely born of the Spirit. And so he says to him, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit. 
and he reveals to him the reality of life. Now, Nicodemus, we know uh, later on with uh, the other guy, I've forgotten his name now, where they buried Jesus in his cave, he actually goes and claims the body of Jesus. He declares himself as a follower of Jesus later on. So we know this is a really genuine uh, seeker, and Jesus is now trying to lead him into a real faith that has power and authenticity. And he says two things to him that I think reveal the spiritual world. And the first thing he says in verse 3, and he says, in verse 3, he says to him, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was trying to see the kingdom of God with reason and religious beliefs. He was trying to understand the kingdom of God with rationality. And so he came to Jesus saying, look, I've watched you. I've seen the signs. I've seen the power. You must be a teacher from God. And he wants to then engage him in a conversation, in a discussion about beliefs, about maybe the Torah, about the understanding of the coming of the Messiah. He wants to engage Jesus in this uh, debate would be a hard word for it, but really a discussion around what's truth and how to actually access the kingdom of God. That's what's going on because that's what the rabbis and so on, that's what they debated around how to interpret the word, how to enter the kingdom of God, when the Messiah would come, all of that. So Nicodemus is on that line and he's trying to engage the kingdom of God with rational understanding, with a belief system and with sort of uh, teachings. That's how he's trying to get there. He's trying to see it with reason and religious beliefs. But Jesus is saying that's not how this works. You can't engage the kingdom of God. You can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born of the Spirit. In Luke 17, uh, Jesus puts it this way. Um, in Luke 17, verse 20, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Luke 17 and verse 20, Jesus says to the people there, he's, he, he's asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come. And he answers them. He says the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He says to them, that they're saying the same thing. They're saying, how can we see the kingdom of God? We want to know. When's it going to come? How can we perceive it? And Jesus says, you're not going to see it with your natural eyes, but it's perceived in the spirit. It's an invisible kingdom that's right now in the midst of you. They didn't know who Jesus was, that he was the king of the kingdom, and they couldn't perceive that. It was They couldn't see that in the natural. They needed to perceive it in the spirit, You know, which is why when Peter has that revelation, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says to him, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the spirit of God, because that seeing of the kingdom has got to come by the spirit. The friends of ours who don't know God, those, those who have yet to discover his grace, it's not, they're not going to do that through rational belief. Our belief is totally rational and it's, you know, we can establish good, solid foundational arguments for the historicity of Jesus, for the accuracy of the scriptures, for, for everything we believe. That You can establish that and very, very strongly. But in the end, that's not, is, that's not actually what's going to get someone to see the kingdom of God. We see the kingdom because the Holy Spirit enables us to. There's lots of debate over how that works. I'm not that bothered, uh, but we know one thing, that we cannot see the kingdom of God unless the Holy Spirit enables us to see the kingdom of God. When I was 13 years old, um, having grown up in church, but I heard the gospel probably for the 50th time, who knows, heard the message of Jesus, prayed a prayer, and for the first time experienced the presence of the Spirit of God in my life. And from that moment on, I could see what God was doing. Not, not necessarily always see everything, but I could perceive the, the spirit of God and the kingdom of God and what he was doing. It's revealed by the spirit. It's not about beliefs and practices. That's not what it's about. We see the kingdom because the spirit enables us to do so. And the work of the spirit is also to reveal spiritual activity and reality around us. So this is what prophecies and revelations and so on are all about. It's about the Holy Spirit enabling us to see what's going on in the kingdom of God. You might be praying for somebody 
and the Holy Spirit reveals something. You might see an image or a picture or have a thought. And that's the Holy Spirit revealing what's happening in the spiritual realm. Because we know we live in a spiritual realm. That's where we actually have to do business is in the spiritual realm, most of which we've got no idea about. We just don't perceive it. There's a wonderful story uh, I always love on this sort of area, and it's Elisha uh, in the Old Testament, 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, verse 17. And it says there, um, Elisha is, is being uh, persecuted by the rulers of Israel um, there was an army or a, or a troop being sent, an army being sent against him, and his servant is panicking. But Elisha is not panicking because he can see what's happening in the spiritual realm. And in verse 17, uh, so 2 Kings 6, verse 17, it says, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So there were these, this army was attacking and coming in and, and, the, and the servant thought, well, we're dead. He's going to make his stand with his uh, master, Elisha. He's, he's going to stand there, and, but he's, he thinks he's going to be killed. But Elisha says, God, please open his eyes. And like out here, I can look out and see the escarpment and it's like over the escarpment. Then there's, there's flames of fire, chariots of fire and angels are out over there protecting Elisha and fighting for Elisha. What an amazing image that's given to this young man to see into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, unless we are born of the spirit, we will not be able to see the kingdom of God. We might be able to see it. And I want to encourage you today. If you, uh, if you don't yet know the grace of God, if, if you're struggling um, with the work of the spirit, then come to Jesus, come to God and say, Lord, I need you. I need to be born of the Spirit. I need the Spirit to come alive in me. We are spiritual beings, and we need to come alive to the Spirit of God in order to see what God is doing around us. There is no doubt that there are angels actively uh, at work around about us, around about our friends. The Scripture is very clear that that's what's happening around us. It tells us that there are demonic works, the fallen angels that are trying to hurt people and bring people down. This is happening all around us, but we don't perceive it. And Jesus says, unless you're born of the Spirit, you won't even see the kingdom of God. And we give thanks to God all the time that he has allowed us to see who Jesus is, like Peter, to have that revelation, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We can't, that can't happen unless there is the work of the Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. So the first thing Jesus says to this religious guy who's really sincere, he says, you, you need to be born of the Spirit. The, this rationality thing is good, but it's not enough. Understanding the law is good, but it's not enough. You must be born of the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. And the second thing he says to him is in verse 5, back in John 3, and in verse 5, he says to him, I truly, I, because the guy says, how can you go and be born in, you know, back into your mother's womb, be born again, etc." And uh, Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. First one was he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then he says you can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He says you, you can't enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born of the spirit. Unless, unless you come alive in the spirit, you can't actually enter into the work of the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was trying to enter in with religious practices. He was trying to, you know, he had all the, the clothing and the, you know, they had these phylactery things that were boxes and things on their arms with the with the commandments in it and all this. And they had to keep all these laws and fasting and sacrifices and all that. And he was trying to enter the kingdom of God with religious practices. People do that today. They, they go to a church. They, you know, in other religions, they go to a temple. They sacrifice. They give offerings. Whatever. People are trying to enter into the kingdom of God, the rule of God, whether it be within the uh, Christian worldview or some other worldview. They're trying to enter into the rule of God, and they're trying to do so with religious practices. And that was Nicodemus. And, you know, in John 4, when Jesus encounters the, the woman at Samaria, then she's trying to do the same thing. 
In John 4, she comes to the well. You remember Jesus at the well midday. This lady comes. He reveals to her that he knows she's got five husbands and living with a guy. She's a mess. And uh, she's had five husbands, not got five. She, and, and he reveals all of that to her. And then in verse 23, she asks this question because she's going to go to religious practice. That's where she's going to try to get into the kingdom of God. And in verse 23, she says, um, uh, verse, rather, rather verse uh, 19, she says, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say Jerusalem is where you should worship. So she starts talking about which mountain you should worship on, in Samaria or in Jerusalem. Which mountain should we be worshipping on in order to enter into the grace of God? It's a religious practice to try to enter the kingdom. And Jesus says to her in verse 23, he says, the hour is coming and now is here where the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him in spirit and in truth. He's saying to them, he says to her, he says, look, the Jews have got it right. That's where they, you know, the practice of the Old Testament is to worship. Them. That's fine. But he says that's irrelevant. There comes a time where it doesn't matter which mountain you're worshipping, you need to worship in spirit and in truth. You need to come to God in spirit and in truth, that the word of God guides you into the presence of God, but his spirit is the empowering force that brings you alive and allows you to enter into the kingdom of God. We enter and live in the kingdom of God through the power of the spirit. This is like, you know, Galatians where he says, hey, what's happened to you? You started in faith and now you're trying to finish in law. You're trying to keep all the laws. That's not how we enter into the kingdom of God. We're born of the spirit and we live in the spirit. That's how the kingdom of God works. I want to read to you a section out of Romans chapter 8 where Paul describes this really clearly. Romans 8 and verse 5. I'm going to read quite a bit. So... Here we go. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it can't. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's Jesus' righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The power and work of the spirit in our lives, bringing strength and healing and blessing and revelation. It's all by living in the spirit of God. He goes on to say, so then, brothers, we are dead as not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul is saying to the church, we live in the spirit. We live in the spirit. We need to be born again to see the kingdom of God. We need to be born of the spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. It's not rationality and religious practices that's going to get us anywhere, but rather the spirit of God at work in us living day in, day out. We live in the Spirit of God. And in conclusion, he says to Nicodemus, don't marvel that I say you need to be born of the Spirit. 
He says, the wind blows where it wills. You don't know where it comes from, where it goes. You see it, it's having an effect. He says, so too is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is way beyond the logical. It's way beyond the rational. It must be perceived and discerned. We need to perceive what's going on around us by the Spirit, what's going on in our hearts and lives by the Spirit, through the Word in our hearts and lives that's that's empowered by the Spirit so that we can then live a life that is honouring to Jesus. The, the message series we're on now is about living in the power of the Spirit, making sure that our lives are absolutely founded and based in the power of God's Spirit. And today I want to encourage you to be born of the Spirit, if you're not already, to come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you for your sin and to come into your life, that his Spirit would come into you and that you would come alive in the Spirit. If you are already born of the Spirit, if you're a believer, a genuine follower of Jesus, then my encouragement is like Paul said to the Roman church, make sure you live in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body, the flesh, all the desires. Put all that to death. We know we wrestle with that stuff. Deal with it. Get forgiveness. Claim his grace. And then live in the Spirit. When we're moving through our lives, be aware of the work of the Spirit that's happening around us. Be aware that God is reaching out and touching people. Be aware that he wants us to speak out for him in the power of the Spirit. When he told the disciples that they would suffer, he said, don't worry about what you will say because the Spirit will tell you what you should speak in those moments. It's good to be prepared. It's good to know and have the reason for our faith. But it's it's better to be empowered by the Spirit, to follow the leading of the Spirit. Do both. Fill your life with the Word of God. Understand where our faith comes from and then be led and empowered by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your presence with us. I thank you for the incredible power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And I pray for myself and for everybody listening today and everybody else in our church through the day today that, Lord, we would be inspired and encouraged to live in your spirit, in your power, in your grace, to make sure that our lives are not just lived in religious practice or lived just in our own minds and our own thoughts, but rather in the power of your spirit. And I ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen.